Hey, Visual Preacher community, it's Steve Thomason, and I have got another treat for you on the podcast today. I have an interview with Dr. Mary Hess, Professor of Educational Leadership at Luther Seminary. She is a Roman Catholic feminist theologian and a foremost scholar of the intersection of digital media and faith formation. Oh yeah. And she's just a downright nice person. So uh, I really enjoyed this interview. We went to lots of different places. We talked about context collapse. We talked about meaning making in dialogical preaching and all kinds of other fun stuff. Just the impact of visuals. And uh, we spent a little time talking about the power of storytelling. So it was a great, great conversation. I love talking to Mary, and I hope that you will enjoy it too. Dr. Mary Hess, thanks for <laughs> joining me on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's going to be going to be a good conversation. Thanks for joining us. Um, just to frame the conversation, just a reminder that uh, this whole visualpreacher.com project and community is really uh, started because I'm working on a book for Fortress Press and the Working Preacher uh, book series, mm -hmm. uh, a book specifically about using visuals in preaching. So uh, I'm finding the experts in the world about visual learning, about visual communication, and so I know that you are premier scholar at the intersection of digital media and faith formation and leadership and religious education, all of those things. And uh, I also had the privilege of having you as my advisor in my PhD dissertation. So um, I knew you were the person to talk to. So uh, just to frame the conversation, because um, I know you could talk about all kinds of wonderful things. <laughs> so to narrow our conversation and to frame it, um, I just want to ask you about, um, pick your brain about uh, using visuals in public communication. Um, primarily, since this is a visual preacher type of thing, we have preachers who stand in front of a congregation in a public space um, and they want to use visuals. So first I want to ask you about like just more of the learning theory around visual learning and visual communication. Uh, and then we'll talk about some practical, like theological stuff and some practical stuff. So first of all, give us a little of your background, like what, what part of this might even interest you and how it connects to your research and your study? Right. Well, sort of the bottom line to all of that is I'm very interested in story and how story shapes meaning. And of course, we live right now in a world that is permeated by digital media in all sorts of ways. And for a long time, most of the scholarship around media focused on image because it focused on film, right? Mm -hmm. Film and then television. And so there's a, there's a enormous literature um, in contemporary work around media and religion. Um, so I, I suppose that was kind of how I started. I started um, by being very interested in media literacy back in the day. Um, and part of what we learned as educators in that process was that um, uh, images are not, uh, the meaning you make with them is not easily controlled, right? And so for a while there, there was a period of time when people tried to control the meaning people made with images. and and even way, way, way back hundreds of years, we could talk about the iconoclastic controversy and how basically religious communities got rid of images because they couldn't control the meaning. Um, so anyway, at this point in time, I'm interested in it because I'm interested in how do you open up meaning? I'm interested in how preaching or any kind of public speaking invites people into a more um, dialogical process of meaning making. And images are particularly helpful there. Visual stuff is helpful. I mean, we could talk about this on lots of levels, but let's talk about um, the arcane science of mirror neurons. Let's talk about how neurologically we know something about the ways in which um, when I see a face, for instance, it clicks things off in my own brain and evokes um, 
like if you look sad, that will evoke in me sadness. If you, I mean, there's, we're learning about the ways in which our processing of visual information functions. Um, interesting tidbit of information is that your brain processes facial information in a different part of the brain than basic visual information. Oh, really? Because facial information is so important to mm -hmm. communication, right? So faces in particular, um, we've evolved to, to pay very, very close attention to faces. But anyway, all right. So part of, part of images, I think, um, are both, I want to say two things about it. One, that you can't control the meaning that's made. Mm -hmm. That's one piece. And the second piece is that they can be particularly good for evoking experience uh, and empathy, right? So um, both of those then stream into when we think about learning. Uh, yeah. We could also talk about different learning styles. We could talk about people who are visual learners versus people who are spatial learners versus, you know, all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think more to the point in terms of what you are exploring is just that the world we are living in is a very image rich space. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we can participate in making meaning in those spaces, the richer and deeper the meaning will be, um, which suggests that in preaching, Either we are describing the world in ways that evoke, uh, you know, visual memories, or we're actually putting in front of people visual images, um, or as you and other people have done, create the visual images even in the process of, um, of preaching. Uh, but anyway. Say more about that. What do you mean uh, as far as, because you kind of called out that last piece as different than the first two, creating, what did you mean by that? Right. Well, I think the action of creation, I, I mean, I, this, I, I could do a whole long riff on why I think our God is a creative God and God communicates within God's very self. And part of that communication um, includes the way we participate in it. And so drawing people into active participation in creating meaning is a very um, vibrant and rich thing to do. And um, it used to be that we could do that easily in preaching simply because people were socialized to sit and engage with whoever was preaching or in a call and response way in some congregations. But these days, more and more people don't have that socialized experience. They have the experience instead of engaging in rich visual landscapes. And so to the extent that we can in religious settings help to um, draw people more actively into creative engagement with those visual landscapes, the better off we are. So for instance, somebody, I mean, I've seen here at Luther, um, we've invited artists in to paint while a liturgy is going on, right? And you begin to see an image emerge from mm -hmm. just paint on canvas, which helps people begin to see something about um, the dynamic way in which images work. I think sometimes we, or at least teachers and sometimes preachers, like to presume that because we are putting out the information, it's just being taken in. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm the expert and therefore you're listening to me. But actually, um, no matter how much expertise I have, you are engaged in, you know, you listen to me and you say, okay, what of that do I agree with or not agree with? Or what question emerges for me? Or same thing with images. Um, one of the things about not being able to control the meaning made with an image this is why it's challenging to use film clips, right? Like a lot of preachers for a while there would try to take an excerpt from a film and put it into the middle of a sermon. The challenge with that being that an excerpt, first of all, is not the whole, and the whole brings all sorts of context. Secondly, people respond to films differently. So a preacher may have used a particular film clip to illustrate a point, which is very clear in the preacher's mind, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the people engaging it had a whole different experience of that film. And so when you put that film clip into the sermon, now they're making a whole different set of meanings with it. You can't, you, you cannot control. You can, you can um, hopefully lead people or guide people or shape a pattern of interaction, but you can't control the meaning. Mm -hmm. I love that because yeah. I want there to be complexity right. to it. So I, I just got distracted, wonderfully distracted by what you just said, because like what you just described about a film, because a film is it is the whole, like the whole canon of the film, right? It's a, right. It's a narrative arc and one little clip has to be taken in context. 
But isn't that what we do with scripture on a regular yeah, basis? Well. <laughs> right? We take one little text and then we preach on the text. But if you don't know the story. Right. This is, well, this is one of the things that is broken down, right? I mean, I think that's why my colleagues, you know, Rolf and Craig and folks have worked on the narrative lectionary mm -hmm. to try to put back into some kind of context. I mean, I, so that's a bigger issue, actually, uh, across all sorts of different realms of meaning making, what anthropologist Michael Wesch calls context collapse, right? We're living in spaces where we know how important context is to meaning making, but the contexts are collapsing all around us. Uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a Christian setting where there was a lectionary that everybody shared, if you knew all the stories in the Bible to begin with, having just a glimpse in the lectionary piece, you know, evoked the rest of it for you. But now we're in a world where not only do people not know most of the stories, they may not even understand where the clip that has been taken into the lectionary comes from, right? Right. So now the preacher if you're if you're in a church that uses a lectionary, and I have to I have to say I'm I'm Roman Catholic, so we use a lectionary, and I appreciate that because it means I'm praying the same texts with people all over the world, and there's something about that that matters to me. Right. But it then becomes the preacher's task or the liturgist's task actually, because you can use music and hymn and all sorts of the uh, ritual around it. But to bring context to what that biblical Mm -hmm. piece is you can't just sort of put it out there and assume that people are going to take it in at all effectively this is of course now why people want to use films right because so many people are watching film <laughs> you know like the whole marvel cinematic universe superheroes a lot of people know superheroes or they a decade ago knew all the harry potter stories and so when when somebody was preaching and wanted to invite somebody into a particular biblical text they would draw on the stories that people knew. The stories people knew were Harry Potter. So how do you draw Harry Potter to help the biblical text, right? Right. And presumably that's some of what you are trying to get at when you're getting at visual preaching. You're trying to create some kind of shared experience that builds context for what it is that you are trying to convey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I, that context collapse. I want to chase that rabbit for just a little bit. Talk more about how you see context collapse impacting the preacher. Right. Well, so meaning, right, is deeply situated and contextual. The, the, the conversation you and I are having right here, um, you and I have history, as you noted earlier, we worked on your PhD together. I've engaged a lot of your, so you and I have all of that when we have this conversation, but the recording that you're putting together that you will put out there, the people who watch it will have very little of that context. Mm -hmm. So they're going to bring their own background to it, their own space, and going to try to make sense of it in mm -hmm. light of what they know. Um, a, a preaching, I think, at its best happens in a community that's together through time. And so the preacher in that community grows to know that community, grows to know um, the hurts and the joys and everything else that lives in that community and can bring that context to the preaching, the proclamation of the word. The challenge comes, right, when our congregations are so um, uh, dissipated that we don't spend a lot of time with each other. We don't know each other's stories. Now we may not even know the stories of the gospel. And so now we're, I mean, I think it's one of the reasons why we have such a hard time in institutional church settings um, because so much of the meaning that are, is being made by younger and younger people, their, their contexts, the stuff that they're immersed in is out there beyond the church walls and they're trying to make sense of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of preachers don't, um, don't attend to that. Don't invite engagement don't don't know enough about what's going on with their congregations to even be able to bring context i spend a lot of time helping seminarians engage social media not because i want them to be proclaiming in facebook <laughs> i want them to be listening mm. in whatever social media their congregation or context is using because that again you're building context you're building shared experience and meaning requires shared experience mm -hmm. right 
we just cannot rely, we used to assume we could rely on a lot of stuff that was shared and it, and it isn't anymore. So we have to kind of, you know, do it in the moment. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> it's so, I mean, and, and what I mean is like you said, the, the congregations are so disparate. They're, they're all out there and there's very little shared context in, in any context in our society. People are living their radically individualized lives and then loosely connecting through social media and sharing the best of themselves, right? Their edited best self. Yeah, or yeah, their edited best self, or even refusing to touch the pain, right? Right. So this is one of my frustrations with a lot of predominantly white congregations is that there's a lot of pain that lives in the world right that we're living in right now around racialization, for instance around systemic forms of racism and white people don't know how to talk about it. We don't know, a lot of us, to be careful, I don't want to overgeneralize, <laughs> but we don't necessarily know how to talk about it. And so we don't, right. which then means our silence speaks in ways that are not helpful. I think about the political whirlwind we're in right now. And at any given point, you could have people in two different parts of whatever kind of political spectrum you want to imagine inhabiting very different realities. Mm -hmm. They may be in the same church, in the same pew, but they have two very, because they're pursuing, you know, they're watching different media or they're, you know, they're situated in different political parties or whatever it is. And we've now said, well, we can't talk politics in church because it's too something. We can't talk this in church because it's too, well, you get rid of all the stuff that most is impacting people's lives I mean, is it any wonder that people find church irrelevant? Right, because we're avoiding the relevant issues. Yeah, and because we haven't learned how to be present to each other mm -hmm. in our brokenness and our in our hurt. And I think that's one of the things that Christian community, particularly Lutheran community, right, with a with a this deep sense of both God's grace and also finding finding Jesus in the middle of the pain, right? The theology of the mm -hmm. cross notion. There is such power to be shared in the heart of that witness that if we don't share it, you know, I mean, if somebody can spend, you know, several hours watching Carnival Row on Netflix or watching, you know, whatever the, the thing is that they're watching that draws them into a story and gives them an experience of um, going beyond themselves, right? Sort of self transcendence. Mm -hmm. They can experience that in other settings. And then they come into a church setting and they don't have deep relationships with each other. And the congregation is not talking about things that really matter. And on top of that, there's all the stress and anxiety about how do we keep this organization functioning? Right. You know, in an individualist space, of course people are gonna run away. Sure. So now to circle this back to the preacher and the use of visuals. Right. The, you said a couple of things. One, one is um, you wanna bring preaching back into more of a dialogical, Right. And also the the fact that community is really we, we have lost the art or w whether we even ever had the art of being able to have conversations about the real issues. That's the most difficult thing, especially in our current climate. Mm -hmm. People just don't know how to talk about uncomfortable things. And 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 we have this practice of preaching, mm -hmm. which is monologue. Right? Well, not dialogical. So it, is there any way that the use of a visual could help that or does it perpetuate that? Well, th this is, I want to go back to the statement you made that preaching is monological. I think it has become that mm -hmm. in settings in which there's no longer deep relationship between the one doing the preaching and the people involved with. So like in, there still are now in certain African-American congregations, a very strong call and response kind of mm -hmm. pattern, right? But even in majority white congregations where 
um, you were either in a small community or you were in a very um, vibrant church setting where people knew each other well, even though one person was speaking and other people were listening, it was not a monologue because the conversa the, there was a conversation going on between the person speaking and the people there just in the very meaning they were making. The challenge has become that we've gotten to a place now where it's very much feels like a monologue, especially if you don't know the texts <laughs> that are being preached about, right? If you don't have the imagination that comes around. So um, I, of course, I don't teach preaching, so it's easy for me to say this, right? But I mean, I, I think we have to do a better job of building that meaning-making space in a way that is dialogical now. Images, right, can do that in varieties of ways. If it's just um, illustration of a predetermined meaning that you're pushing down somebody's throat, that's a monologue. If in the process of preaching, um, I don't know, a text like uh, um, new wineskins kind of text or looking for the signs of the times and you invite people sitting there to pull out their phone and to share with the person sitting next to them an image that they took in the last week of something that matters to them. Now you've got a dialogue going in the pew, you've, in, you've drawn on their technology which is in their pocket and you're you as the preacher are constructing a space of meaning that is very dialogical. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's like enormous opportunity there. There's enormous opportunity to take, um, I don't think you've ever done this with me in one of my, I have this exercise I do in my classes where I have people create collages where mm. they take images from magazines. They literally cut them apart and, and put them into a collage and then we go through a process of engaging the meaning of that collage. And it's, people love the exercise. It's really creative because they're bringing active meaning to it. I think, you know, part of what visual stuff I've watched, I was thinking about you ahead of time, actually, because there's a piece you did um, years ago that I still use in a class. That's the um, fusion of horizons piece you know the the three satellites around you know mm -hmm. that that Ungetters image stuff yeah where you're trying to talk about um the necessity of multiple perspectives to get to a deeper truth right mm -hmm. i could talk i could say what i just said and you might or might not get it but watching that vivid animation of those images makes that point so much more easily and um helps people um experience what it could be to have multi you know multi-perspectival engagement mm -hmm. so i can say multi-perspectival <laughs> and and my sister would look at me and go huh huh right <laughs> or i could show the video with the little satellites and she'd get it right so that's an interesting thing because help me understand a couple different things because on one hand we're talking about using visuals to invite people into meaning making, right? Because people bring their own, it's a subjective. And I know we talked a lot about Parker Palmer and Stephen Brookfield and all of the subject oriented learning. Right. So relational knowing it's not relativist. It's not objectivist. It's relational. Right. And so, so we all bring ourselves to the subject and the subject itself speaks to us and that play. Um, so that's that's one thing over here, but then also, and, and you said that if you use an illustration to drive home a predetermined meeting, then that's monological. But then also, that example you just used was a use of a visual right. that explains something right. because a picture is worth a thousand words. So are those conflicting or are they complementary? Thinking about this from like the theory. Right. Can of, I say yes? In other yeah, words, so both and, right? Very Lutheran, Lutheran <laughs> answer. Yes, both and. <laughs> I, so the, 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 what I would say is part of the um, part of the distinction, or or, or part of what to, to pay attention to, is are you using um, a visual in a way that uh, helps deepen and make more complex the meaning, that helps people experience it with more depth or are you using it to skim off just one particular point?
point, mm. right? And the one of the ways you know the difference because I think it's I think you can have the in, intent of doing something and the impact can be very different. One of the ways I know the difference is if it if people stay involved with it, you know, like if it if it evokes new questions for them, if they are curious about it. There's an image I use sometimes. I was just doing this thing at Westminster Presbyterian a couple Sundays ago, and there's this image I have of a um, of a cylinder. So if you imagine a cylinder in your head, if you shine a light at it from one angle, it's going to throw on the wall what looks like a rectangle, right? The shadow. If you shine, right. If you shine a, a light on it from the end, it's going to look like a circle, mm -hmm. right? You get, I mean, it's hard yep. for me to describe it. I could show it in the image really easily. Exactly. <laughs> but, There's a good example of the use of image, right? Right, exactly. And, and part of what that image does is it say, look, you know, your perspective shapes how you're engaging something. And it's true, but it's incomplete, mm -hmm. yeah? So an illustration like that helps to open up meaning, I think. Mm -hmm. um, however, you could use, um, I don't know if you, I'm trying to think if you could use that image to shut down meaning. You could maybe use that image and say, um, the light should only go from this angle because if you're reading scripture from this angle, it should only, you know. Right. And now you're closing it down rather than making it more complex. Yeah, that's great. So I, I was thinking th there's so many, I, you, you've, you've used the phrase meaning making a lot. And, and way back at the beginning of the conversation, you named what I think is a, a real fear of some preachers is the loss of control of meaning. So, mm -hmm. Can we talk about that a little bit more as like, how does, first of all, just address the fear of the preacher of losing control. Because if you throw a bit, if you throw up a visual, you are now out of control. Well, okay, but let's just remember as a preacher, the minute the words leave your lips, you are out of control of the meeting that's made from them, right? You've had, I'm sure you've had the experience of preaching. And then as you're shaking hands at the door, somebody comes up and says, oh, thank you so much for saying that. And what they tell you is not at all what you said. Or right? they say, why did you say that? And they're like, I never said that. <laughs> right, right. So see, I mean, the, the thing is that we are, we are constantly, this is why story, remember how we started, I, I was saying something about context collapse. Mm -hmm. Part of what story does is it builds, it builds connections, it builds context. If I, if I can tell you a story, beginning, middle, and end about something, it's going to stick with you longer right um so the story of scripture part of of um well this is a theological point right i mean we are always doing this in the presence of the holy spirit so we ultimately are not in control let's just be honest about that up front mm -hmm. so the discernment i mean i think about the little prayer i say at the beginning whenever i preach right may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Okay, that's a biblical quote. It's also a very heartfelt prayer for me. That, you know, I don't know, how, you know, what are we going to do in this next chunk of time? How is it going to come together? And I, I, I think, I mean, yes, a picture has a thousand words. Um, and we don't control the thousand words. But what a picture also does, or an image, is it, it's a shared experience, at least for those of us who can see. I mean, I, and I actually haven't told you this, but I've lost all the vision in one eye and my other eye is now challenged too. So I've had to confront the fact that I may lose the ability wow. to see in some ways at some point in the future. And you know that, that has made me very conscious of how visual imagery is only one element of how mm -hmm. we tell stories, right? Sound is another really crucial part. And I think one reason why there are preachers who are understandably anxious about images is because they intuitively know something about the intimacy of the human voice. Mm. And they worry that an image is going to overpower the intimacy of the voice, right? Uh, right. So that's not so much about control as it is about recognizing, oh, well, wait a minute. Proclamation is a very powerful um, form of relational intimacy. Mm -hmm. And are we going to somehow put up some barriers to that? You know, and that's another... Um, so like the I, be distracting. 
Is that what you're uh, saying? The image can be distracting. Yeah, the image can be distracting and the image can be, I mean, I, this is, this is another, it's like the difference between, um, I'm trying to think if I could give you a good example. I mean, there are ways in which images can open up meaning and there are ways in which images become didactic and close down meaning. And I think that is shaped by context. So it's hard to say up front, this given image is going to do this, right? You, you need to know your space. Um, and it's hard, as we said earlier, to know what your space is because, right? So sometimes you can shape that by, if you're going to put an image in front of somebody, you're going to put an image in front as part of preaching, how are you inviting people to attend to that image, right? I mean, this is another thing about a world permeated by digital media is that our focus, is our attention is constantly being, um, it, it, claims on our intention are constantly being put out there. We're constantly being distracted in all sorts of ways. So finding a way, finding an image, maybe one image that you can keep engaging, that you can give people an experience of and you can draw them more deeply into it. And now they're really, it becomes the way my Greek Orthodox friends talk about icons. It becomes a window to God as opposed to a, a flat door. That's the piece, you know, like how do we, how do we invite an engagement that, um, that recognizes experience, that draws on experience, that invites experience to be shaped by engagement, that keeps it dialogical, that, you know, mm -hmm. all well, of those things. Is this a, an example of a visio divina, the, the opposite of lectio divina? Right. Well, first of all, it's not the opposite of Lexio Divina. You know, do you, do you know not, the video? Not, not the opposite, but it, uh, uh, Lectio Do you know the process that they put together at St. John's? Like when you use that word, are you talking about that or are you talking more generally? I am talking about uh, a meditative reflection on an image. Okay. So one of, the, one of the ways in which, so the monks, the Benedictines are the ones that came up with the notion of Lexio Divina, right? And St. John's in Collegeville, who you know commissioned the um, St. John's Bible, which is the Ill fully illuminated Bible, they developed a process as they were developing the illuminations for that Bible called Visio Divina. And the Visio Divina process begins with the kind of lexio that we're used to with words and then invites creative responses. Hmm. And in inviting the creative responses um, can include as well one of the images that they've already done, but they don't go to an image they've already done. Like you wouldn't go to the illumination until you first ask people to respond themselves, whether it's drawing or sometimes it's poetry or other kinds of creative things. So that process slows down the engagement and opens it up. I think that's different from the kind of um, meditation that you might do with an icon, right? So an icon is carefully painted or prepared in a given way i mean especially my orthodox friends will tell you there's a very careful process that's involved there and when you meditate on an icon uh, you engage in disciplines of listening that slow you down that open you up that that breathe into the icon if that's what you're talking about that's also a good process mm -hmm. it's different from the visio divina that saint john's was doing I uh, just opened up a, a, a few few new windows for me because so I'm I'm also thinking about the book in my head right. as we're talking right, and I know that for me in my own practice because I am an artist and because I am a cartoonist, I actually practice that visio divina that you're describing as I'm studying the text, I literally draw it out, yeah. which is where most of my slides come from. Is it because people say, man, how do you have time to do a graphic novel of Matthew? Like, well, that's, that's how that's I studied how Matthew, it. Yeah. right? And so one of the things that I, I'm wondering if I can communicate to preachers is that there is a visual way of meditating on the text that then, and it doesn't have to be artistic, it can be schematic, it can, it, it, but it's a way of engaging the text that then turns into a storyboard. Mm -hmm. that then becomes a way to to create visual pegs to help your congregation track through the logic 
Mm-hmm. Does that hold water? Is that? Oh yeah, no, for sure. Think, I mean, look at one of the things, you know this about me. I love to do digital storytelling as a form of faith formation with people. Yes. Now, part of the way that process works is that we first start by telling each other stories, absent any images, absent any digital tech, absent any, just to try to get the story heard. Mm-hmm. And then you start to layer images on it. But part of why I think that process works is not even the images. It's that you're slowing down and telling the story over and over again. So, for instance, the way you were just talking about it, you're talking about activating um, a form of engagement with a text, so, which is a creative engagement, a drawing engagement. I mean, some people have, we used to teach bibliodrama around here. I don't think anybody's doing that right now, but that's a dramatic reenactment of a text, right, to sort of begin to feel your way into parts of it. But doing that, studying it that way, you're slowing down your engagement. You are, you are tasting it deeply right that's mm-hmm. the lexio thing you are you are um yeah you are engaging it and i and i think one of the potential i mean i i you know this i love it when you do visualizations of lectures <laughs> and and people in my field like the last time you were at rea and did those pieces that people were over the moon excited about it because what you are really good at doing is listening carefully and then laying it out in a way that helps people grasp it more deeply, right? right? Helps people return to it in a way that is richly interesting for them. And my experience of your visualizations is not that they shut things down, rather it's that they help me remember the pegs, like you were just saying, the pegs are the piece so that I get more deeply into it. Yeah, that's great. And if you can help preachers do that, that would be awesome. Yeah, good, good. So, so that was one thing that opened up and then the other thing I may have just forgotten, but it's, it's um, so maybe we'll come back to that. Okay. But man, we've covered such rich ground. Um, I, I want to, I want to shift gears real quick. And it, thinking about the, the preacher who maybe is still intimidated. We've talked about the loss of control. Um, mm-hmm. And, but maybe they've bought into the idea, yeah, I, maybe I should use visuals. Um, how, how do they choose a visual? Like, oh do, yeah. advice to the beginner. <laughs> yeah, well, not only in choose, but how do you display, right? Because one of the challenges with visuals is that our, our congregations, for the most part, are in spaces that... Um, focused attention in a particular way towards a particular point, which may not be easily, like, you know, (laughs) maybe you have a big screen so you can put a really large image up, but in a lot of sanctuaries, you don't have that kind of space. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've watched people do is pair an image with movement, right? Like you might have two or three images and you have a congregation move around them. Now, you've got a thousand people in a congregation, that's a whole different ball game. Most of the congregations I work with are pretty small, but um, there's some basic kinds of things. And I think you could probably find in any number of media education stuff, rules for images, but there are a couple things I keep in mind, right? Like um, when you're looking at an image, um, who's in and who's out of it, right? Like it can be very dangerous to use human beings in images because our norms in, white dominant society are often white or male or you know cisgender or whatever and we don't even think about it and that's the image we've put out there and now we've closed out a lot of other images right um so if you're going to use people this this is just sitting on my desk right now right like this just came i don't know if you can see this there's a there's an image that has lots of different people in it right right (laughs) um so if you're going to use people you have to think about things like that who's in the image who's out of the image if you're using um, uh, nature, which I think is often a very powerful kind of visual to use, a photograph of, of nature, um, then you want to think the same way you would with a painter. What's the focal point? Like where are your eyes drawn first? And you know that's that's a setting. <laughs> I've seen an awful lot of images people have tried to use in worship that are very cheesy images, and they thought it was a nice image, but it didn't occur to them that the way it was framed, it was going to draw your attention right over here when what they actually wanted you to look at was over here. Uh. 
So who's in, who's out, where's the focal point? Um, is it a big enough that people can actually see it? Mm -hmm. You know, if they can't see it, how are you going to help them? You know, are you going to put something at the beginning as people walk in? Mm -hmm. Are you going to have something um, reprinted on a bulletin so that there may be the big piece you're looking at, but there's a small version of it in front of them in a bulletin? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, it's all about don't just assume that you know what meaning is going to be made with it or how you can see it. Go put yourself in the position of somebody in the congregation. Right. Um, it, it's funny. I was uh, in preparation for our conversation. I was coming through the vast wealth of resources on your site which I will link to in the comments. Um, and I came across uh, your link to Guy Kawasaki's 10, 20, 30 rule for presentations. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, the 10, in it, what is it? 10 slides, 20 minutes, and 30 point font. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Just practical. Pra well, this is why one of the things we teach here in the MA, in the professional MA degrees, is at the capstone, used to be people had to write like an 80 page thesis. Now we have them doing a 30 page paper and an Ignite presentation. And an Ignite presentation, I'm not gonna remember the number. It's like, you know, 15 slides, five seconds on each one, or I mean, whatever ends up being five minutes. So it's a five minute presentation. And the slides are set up to automatically advance so that you, giving the presentation, have to learn how to narrate it live when it's advancing, you don't get to do the advancing, it's advancing for you, right? Wow. And you begin to discover that you can't put a lot of text on the screen because people can't read the text in that amount of time. You begin to discover that you want an image that may be a little confusing or you know, that somebody has some curiosity about it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's another, the, the Zen of PowerPoint, right? I can't think of that guy's name. Um, do you know, do you know that stuff? There's, I have to look it up. Well, there's a, there's a person who Tufty? for a long time had a blog. No, although Tufty stuff is wonderful too. Yep. Tufty's visual stuff is amazing, but there's a guy whose name I'm forgetting that had a blog called um, Presentation Zen or the Zen of Presentation. I don't know. It's, it was eventually made into a book, but his point was trying to help people make PowerPoint slides that actually were graphically pleasing right? Rather than a set of bullet points. And mm -hmm. I, I think this again is partly, you know, as I, well, you've maybe heard me tell the story. People used to call me and say, would you please come consult with us on how to put a projector in worship? And I would go, well, why would you want to do that? <laughs> right? And their response would be something like, well, you know, this is, you know, 10 years ago. Um, we want young people to come. <laughs> I'd say, well, look, putting a projector in worship is not going to entice young people. You know, you might try Taizé, you might try candles, you might try, you know, an experience that draws them in. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's going to be hard, honestly, Steve, and I look forward because I think if anybody can do it, it will be you. <laughs> um, I, I think it's going to be really hard to figure out how to come up with advice that can work across contexts because mm -hmm. yep. it's an adaptive challenge. It's not a technical sure. one. Right. Exactly. I, I know, I already know that um, there's going to be two tracks within the book. One is I'm calling the analog preacher and the other is the digital preacher because you said it earlier in our conversation, like the majority of congregations that you work with are in small sanctuary spaces that don't have projection and that's okay yeah. because visual communication is not a digital phenomenon. Right. Um, it, it's the use of sight. It's how you move your body. It's how the, you know, using props, think children's sermons. They're the most clearly communicated <laughs> sermons we have <laughs> because they understand multi-sensory learning. Now, my book is limited to visual, but it really is about multi-sensory. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been great books written about that, which leads me to my last question, because we could, I could spend hours and hours talking to you, um, and maybe I'll call again and we'll have another chat. Um, but my last question to you is this. Uh, I'm going to share your resources, and you've written a, a bunch of books about this intersection of digital 
media faith formation and i know you're really passionate especially around uh racial issues in our society so i'm going to point people to that great stuff but my question for you is who else is talking about this that we can learn from about visual learning about visual communication about the theology and some guiding lights maybe two or three leads yeah, wow it's such a rich conversation going on right now right i mean i um i think who do i go back and forth you know some of the some of the people whose work i like the best is are less about visual and more about story right so herb anderson and ed foley have a book called mighty stories dangerous rituals mm. and part of what they talk about in that book is the mythic and the parabolic and how those come together and i i think images do that so that book to me is a really i mean it's an older book now i don't know 1990 or 2000 something like that um there are some people who write about this stuff a lot so david morgan who is a scholar who's an art historian has done a lot of work around religious imagery and practice, practices around it. I think his work is really interesting. Um, there's a long chain of people who have spent a lot of time thinking about beauty and theology and the way beauty evokes transcendence. And so there are folks like Alejandro Garcia Rivera's work that I think is really powerful. Um, oh gosh. Uh, you know, there's the whole re media, religion, and culture crowd, and you know, you've been to some of those meetings, you know those people. Um, I really like what's going on in the um, discussion around kids and digital literacy, because there's a lot of stuff there about production, about creation, about how you create to learn. In fact, that's the name of a pretty famous book by a woman named Renee Hobbs, Create to Learn. and um, they do a lot of work with helping young people think about how to use images to evoke story. And so, you know, I'm back to story. I suppose the other person that I read a lot is Joe Lambert, who hmm. is at a place called Story Path, which used to be called the Center for Digital Storytelling. Um, but, you know, you've also got, you've got the people like StoryCorps who now are doing animations to their their audio pieces. Oh gosh, I don't know. Steve, this is actually, to be very honest, if somebody asked me that question and it wasn't you, I'd say, go talk to Steve Thomas. <laughs> so, you know, That's I nice mean, to hear. <laughs> I was just looking at your website and you have storyingfaith.org. Right. Yeah, that's, that's my research website. And that's where you're looking at story. And so it's all interconnected. And oh, I remember the other window that we opened up, and maybe this will be another conversation, but it was about um, that we are, we make sense out of by story. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have another conversation about that one. So I, I think I'm going to, we need to wrap up this one. But man, this has been rich. We've uh, got great, great stuff, great conversation. And what I'm hoping is that uh, this will spark my research. And for our visual preacher community, uh, they get to hear your voice and be uh, tune into your work. Um, mm -hmm. What what's the what's the project you're working on right now that you want everybody to know about? The project I'm working on right now. Well, the the absolute immediate project I'm working on is called Create, Share, Believe: Storying Faith in a Post Church World. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how we do this stuff, how we do creative participatory work. And I and for me, it's about hope, but hope in the middle of trauma, because I think we are in, in, in a world right now that is suffused with trauma, and we haven't done such a great job of drawing on mm. the presence of Jesus in the middle of that. So where should we look as we anticipate that coming to the world? My website. <laughs> is it a book or is it a digital? Yeah, well, it's, I have a monograph that I'm trying to get into some shape to put out there in the world because no publisher really wants it yet. It's too ah. theological or not theological enough. And so I'm trying to, if you want a really good um, brief version on my website, there's a piece I wrote for America Magazine called, And the Word Went Viral. Hmm. And that piece, which is, I hope, pretty accessible and pretty short, is kind of the 
elevator speech of the other projects. Well, that sounds exciting. So in the visual preacher uh, group and community that uh, hopefully we'll check that out and keep us posted on that. Well, I'm so glad you're doing this, Steve. I just find the stuff that you're interested in. I am so interested in it myself. So oh, good. thank you. I'm yeah. really glad you're working on this. Thanks. I look forward to our ongoing dialogue and partnership. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks for being here. Thanks for doing it. Mm -hmm.